time. Welcome to another exciting microcontrollers lecture here. Um, I hope you guys all had a good break. Um, I had a lot of fun. Um, I got a new piece of hardware, which um, I'm going to describe for you, and it will help us with our, um, our little um, touchstone synthesizer project, which I thought would be fun. Uh, so what I did was I hooked it up to the output of my um, dual tone multiple frequency generator. And uh, what you can do, I think if I turn up the volume, I, I like to keep it down because it's annoying. So I guess you can hear that, right? So it's decoding it. I'm going to move this wire here and so you can see what's going on. Yeah, it's decoding it in real time using a little chip. And the little chip, this is a board I got on Amazon for the decode so that we could see that it's actually able to um, decode in real time. And, and uh, then I made a modification to my program um, so that what you could do is you could turn a knob and speed things up a little bit. And, and, and my question was sort of, I wonder how fast we can push it before this chip gets swamped. And, and you, you can, guys can hear this, right? It's really annoying. Yeah. But it's, it's working, right? So you can sort of see it counting up through the different numbers. And it's still able to keep up. So it's working pretty fast. I mean, that's faster than I can dial. And this is a digital data communications problem, right? Because you have to be able to decode the different symbols quickly. And at some point, what will happen is it gets out there to the point where it can't keep up. And there is about there, there, right there. So he, he got stuck. He can't decode it. It's going by too fast. And of course, I can, I can play it way faster than that. He'll kick in again. As soon as it gets a little bit slower, now we can start decoding again. So therein lies an interesting problem. How fast can you decode these signals and still get useful data out of it? And I, I just, you know, I, I just had, I couldn't resist speeding this up to the point where the thing breaks because I like to test the corner points on these kinds of engineering problems. And that's a real you know, analysis slash synthesis problem, right? So if you think about it, what you're doing with the DTMF generator, that, this is synthesizer, so that's synthesis. But this little chip in here that's uh, sitting in the decode facility, that's actually doing the analysis. And that lets you do embedded control. And one of the things you can do, I mean, you can not just pass it through plain old telephone service, right? You know, just it's not just about telephones. You could take this, these tones, you could record them on a little cassette recorder and then play them back. That could be your, like your program. And so if you can decode these things at a specific rate through the communication channel, then you essentially have established the data rate. And this in lies what I would call um, uh, the theoretic channel capacity of the system, given, given the way in which we're doing our encoding. And so that's, a, um, uh, that's an interesting discussion in and of itself. And so what I did was I prepared um, a little bit of a lecture here on the um, DTMF synthesis and analysis, because I thought it was just so interesting what we were doing here and so relevant to other courses like communication systems courses and the like. And so um, uh, this is what we're dealing with, right? We've got our typical Arduino doing the synthesis um, we've hooked it up to our little uh, DAC, and then I took the DAC output and I just hooked it to the input of our little um, our little uh, DTMF analysis chip. 
So the analysis is not being done in the Arduino at all. Although in theory, maybe you could write a program that does, that's not doing it, we're doing it in hardware. And so here it is with the lights on uh, and you can see the little chip with the lights, when, when the lights on and, and, and the contrast normal, all the LEDs kind of blur into one another. And this is a totally cheap little board. You can get them cheaper off of eBay. I bought one off of Amazon. I think two of these boards cost like 650 and it just seemed like a fun thing to try. And you can see over in here, the output, one of them goes to my speaker and the other one goes directly to the input of the board. I think that's the advantage of having a little board instead of buying the chip and wiring it up because you can just plug straight into it because it's got a you know, handy port. And then all it needs is power. Uh, the ground comes in from the shield on the, um, on the little headphone jack. So I didn't even bother wiring that up. I was surprised. You can see the black cable is here because I was ready to wire up ground, but then I realized, oh no, it's getting ground from, from, the, from the audio input. So that was cool. And uh, what I did was, um, you can kind of see the uh, modification I made to the, uh, to the code. Um, what I did was I measured the potentiometer over here. That's A0, that's my input. And then I took that sensor value, divided it by 10 um, and used that as my duration, which went in divided by a thousand and that, that became my new symbol rate, my baud rate. And so um, that baud rate represents how many different tones you're getting per second, which is really different from the bit rate. Bit rate and baud rate are different and they have to be, right? So in other words, if you're, if you're in the Arduino, Let's see if we can get the, um, the port going. Yeah, so here's the port, right? And what we'll do is we'll look at the monitor. And then what we'll do is um, we'll see if we can get, I don't know what the, what the uh, baud rate is on this thing, I forget. 115200, yeah, that's a little, a little bit high. 115200, that should give us, yeah. Bit rate. See, board rate and bit rate are different. Let's let's listen and see what that sounds like. That's that's pretty darn fast. In fact, what we can do as we watch it is, um, I think we can bring up the. Um, well, it must be in here somewhere. Somewhere around here, there's going to be a quick time movie. But apparently I can't see it. I don't know why. Maybe, maybe because my PowerPoint's in the way. I, I have no idea. It should be out here. Oh, here it is. I see it's off, off screen. It's off screen. There it is. So now you can see it's, it's, this is real time. This has not been recorded. And uh, what I'll do is I'll slow things down a little bit. And now when you take a look at the um, output of the Arduino, you can see he's slowing things down quite a bit. So what we'll do is we'll get both of these things up here at the same time. So you can see what it looks like as we uh, speed things up. So symbol rate, 40 tones per second is really different from bit rate 160 bits per second. Why is that? Why should that be? Things will fail pretty quick when we get out there. I think around 64. Yeah, 71. It doesn't, it doesn't, it can't handle it. So you gotta be around 62 symbols per second. But the bit rate, the bit rate's quite a bit higher, 248 bits per second. Now we can transmit much faster, but we can't decode much faster. So that's that's the maximum I can get this thing to start transmitting, um, 4,000 uh, bits per second, but he's not decoding it. So it's not particularly useful with this chip, although maybe we could find something that's a little bit faster. I gotta turn this down because it's driving me nuts. Yeah, so leave it, leave it to me to assign the world's most annoying annoying final project because it makes such an annoying sound. But anyway, having said that, 
um, it's interesting because you get to see directly why bit rate and baud rate are different, radically different. Why is that? Why should they be different? Any, any, any ideas? No, no, um, no takers on that one. No guesses. I mean, if you have more bits to use, you could decode faster and faster. More bits? Well, I, let's put it a different way. Um, when we were um, doing the um, symbols, the number of symbols we have is 16, right? Zero through nine, A through D plus star and pound. So if you got 16 symbols and it, each symbol is equally probable right, because of how you do your coding, right? This is called channel coding. Then what you will do is you will take log to the base two of the total number of symbols and that'll tell you how many bits you get per symbol. So number of symbols per second is totally different than the number of bits per second because the number of bits associated with each symbol, right? This is, the, this is called the Shannon, the Shannon theoretic channel capacity um, is equal to log to the number of uh, base two of the number of bits. And you get log to the base two by taking log of n and dividing by log of two. So log to the base two of uh, 16 is equal to four bits per symbol because two to the four is equal to 16. Bit rate is not equal to baud rate and baud, baud comes from Emilia Baudot, a uh, French mathematician who was around during the Civil War. So this is a, um, an interesting idea, right? Because when we code with tones and we have all these different tones, we need to be able to discriminate between them. If we can do that efficiently, then if we can know how fast we can do the analysis, that's the chip's rate for decoding, then effectively we can compute our, our bit rate, which wasn't particularly fast, but it was interesting because we were just using touch tones to do it. Now, obviously we could have more um, efficient means of decoding, uh, but I think this is an interesting approach to learning how a communication system works. Right, so this is this is a key element. We have a digital communication system, which is encoding touch tones into a an audio channel, actually a voice channel, right? Because telephones don't go beyond four kilohertz, right? Their sample rate is eight kilohertz, so you can't go much higher in frequency than that, and you're limited by your signal to noise ratio. But here we're not actually limited by that. We can take the output from our Arduino and plug it directly into the chip. And that gives us a theoretic maximum um, baud rate because we know our chip can't go faster than that. Even, well, assuming, assuming our connection to the Arduino is noise free and pretty much is relative to a, relative to a phone system. So when we think about like our Arduino, um, outputting these different frequencies, we can see there's low tones, right? From 697 to 941. And clearly we could have gone lower. And then there are high tones from 1209 to 1633. And we couldn't have gone much higher, although we could have, I suppose, I don't know. Um, uh, probably, probably you could go all the way up to something close to 3500 Hertz. So if we wanted to, we could have created a new touch tone system that used many, many more tones. But in fact, what we have here is a DTMF system so that with, when you press the one, you not only get 697 Hertz, you get 1209 Hertz. You gotta have both. So the first thing you wanna do is you wanna discriminate between low tones and high tones. How do you do that? How do you mean like discriminate? Well, how do you separate the low tones from the high tones? You would filter one of them out. Yeah, you filter, a, you get a low pass filter for the low tones and a high pass filter for the high tones. And then you have to build a detector for each one of these tones to figure out which button is being pressed. That's how the analysis is, is gonna work. So when we look at uh, something like, um, I gotta get this. This, this stick out of the way here. I don't know how to do that. But anyways, um, 
Do you do you see the the zoom controls on the top? Are they being digitized? No. no. Good. Okay. Then it doesn't matter. I see them, but you guys don't. Um, so so here's what happens when you when you um, change your duration, and you don't have to do this, okay, for your for your final project. But I did it because I just wanted to know what was going to happen when my little analysis chip um, failed. I wanted to you know explore the corner points and the, the various bit rates. Um, so what we're doing is we're taking our high no, our high frequency and we we um, we're, we're running it at um, maybe one um, 50th of a second. And the reason I say that is because if you have a board rate of um, 50 symbols per second, you can apply that to the different numbers that are being generated. So with the high frequency, um, 1633 hertz, um, and you know that's the case because it says 1633 here in the lower right. I got a low frequency of 697. My highest frequency is 1633. I want to know how many cycles there are in a 50th of a second. So I take um, 50 and divide it into 1633. And I say, oh, I got 32 cycles to play with in order to recognize that frequency. But now I got to do it again, only for the low frequency thing. And so for the low frequency thing, I got the 697 Hertz. I divide that through by 50 and I got to come out with a, um, an answer of yes, I see that frequency within 14 cycles. Now, if you think maybe I could have done that faster, maybe you can, um, then maybe you could get a faster recognition rate. Now, here is a MATLAB output for the uh, dual tone multiple frequency input. In the top, you see the two frequencies combined. Then at the bottom, you see the low frequency. And at the top, you see the high frequency. And what you do on over here is you take what's called a fast Fourier transform, and you can see the um, power spectral density at the two different frequencies. And that will help you to do the identification. And in fact, you could do an FFT on the touch tones to identify the different numbers that are being pressed. And that's a reasonably good thing to do, a Fourier transform. And you might have seen these things if you took an ordinary differential equations class or a linear systems class. You probably saw Fourier transforms, if not fast Fourier transforms. Fast Fourier transforms are just algorithms to help you do a Fourier analysis. And Fourier analysis is just a, um, a, um, a, a um, an integral over a voltage as a function of time multiplied by a sine wave and then a cosine wave or a sine wave with varying phase, two, two different phases. So it's a correlation between sine waves at different frequencies. And that amount of correlation, that's what you call the Fourier coefficient. And certainly we could have a lovely discussion about Fourier transforms, but that's beyond the scope of my little microprocessors course. If you take linear systems, you'll learn all about it. Or if you take ordinary differential equations, you'll learn about it. Um, or even if you take biomedical signal processing, you'll learn about it. So that's a um, that's kind of a thing. FFTs, everybody knows about them. Common algorithm, nice and fast. And um, I could talk to you till I'm blue in the face about that one. So yeah, you could use FFTs to do the analysis, but that's not what they do in a practical chip. You know, um, if you record it and do the whole thing offline with MATLAB, yeah, no problem. But if you want it to go in real time. This is not the way to go. So here it comes, the chip. And um, you get these in different form factors. This one is in a dual inline package. The one I got is in an SO, a small outline integrated circuit package. You count the pins, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it's an 18 pin SO IC. Um, so this is um, gonna take the DTMF tones and give you a four bit code that corresponds to the tones as they come in. And what's inside of this silicon is kind of interesting. And you know, it's a little bit of a mystery when you look at the data sheet, exactly how they implemented certain things. And we'll talk a little bit about that because I think they wanted to keep it like the secret sauce. They don't feel a need to tell you how they implemented stuff. They just want to tell you what the input and the output is. But they give you a basic idea. Also, you know, from an Arduino point of view, it's kind of interesting to do remote control. Right? You could call up your home and start typing something in from the keypad 
an Arduino can control your house, right? You know, hit, hit the button and then uh, turn on the lethal uh, burglar alarm that has the remote control um, spear gun or something. I don't know what it does. Um, so, so, I mean, you could see somebody coming in with ring, right? Oh no, it's burglars. They're taking my packages. And so you open the trap door and they go into the bottomless pit with the alligators or something. I, I don't really know what you do with these things. So um, here comes, I mean, you know, you, you, you've, you've, you've been victimized by this, right? Press one for English. Press two if you um, don't give a crap. Press three if you would rather eat glass than sit on hold for the next 45 minutes. Um, that sort of thing. So there's a, um, uh, a chip. This is the chip I got with a crystal. That's a, that's a whole other story. They call this a subcarrier crystal, which is used for the old style analog television systems. It has the world's cheapest crystal and it runs at 3.58 megahertz. And um, uh, that's powering this chip and it needs a precise or reasonably precise crystal on input. And you'll see why in a minute. And then um, this is the tip of the um, connector, the ring that's gonna be your ground. And then the rest is just some ancillary stuff for showing output like the LEDs. And you would probably wire this directly into your Arduino and measure the tone that's being pressed. So it's really a hybrid um, analog and digital integrated circuit, truly hybrid. So here is the buttons, right? And here are the low frequencies. And then here's the high frequencies. And now here is the binary coded output, which is what you've been watching as the little blinky lights go by really quick. And so that's kind of what you would be using as your input to your Arduino if you were trying to decode these touch tones using the hardware. So that's not too bad, I think. And then um, this is what's inside. So now we've got the low pass filter, which low passes at everything under 941 Hertz. And we got the high pass filter, which is high passing everything above 1209 Hertz. And so um, here's the high group filter. There's the low group filter. And somewhere in here, there's a thing called a dial tone filter. And dial tones are around 400 Hertz. I forget the frequency exactly, but you wanna get that dial tone out of there. So that's like a little notch filter. Notch filters are kind of like uh, an overlap between a high, high pass and a low pass filter. They, they just knock out the um, one frequency that you don't want. That's what a notch filter does. And dial tones come in um, at frequencies that we recognize, I think they're 400 Hertz or so. So that's the, um, that's the shtick, that's the, that's the chip. They don't tell you what the digital detection algorithm is. They don't tell you how the filters work and they don't tell you what is in these little zero crossing detectors, but we can guess, we can guess what's in it. Um, so here's a little blow up. Um, they call this a, um, a switched capacitor filter, right? And that's, that's filtering out 440 Hertz. That's gonna be, um, well, it's a concert A. I guess that's what your dial tone is supposed to be. Maybe 350 to 440 is the range. And um, that gets taken out by this thing called a third order switch capacitor filter which notches out these two frequencies. And then there's a six order switch capacitor filter and another six order switch capacitor filter for the high pass and the low pass. And so then your next question is gonna be, what's a switch capacitor filter? Does anybody know what that is? You guys, have you guys seen that before? Well, I know what a capacitor filter sometimes is like used for filtering out certain, like shorting out like certain frequencies. Well, you, you've heard of um, RC filters, right? Resistor capacitor filters. Right, right. But switch capacitor filters are different. They're just like, well, RC filters. And the difference is they're switches, just like you might imagine. 
So S1 will close while S2 opens, and you'll never have S1 and S2 open at the same time. And then S2 will close when S1 opens, and you can control how long this capacitor under the switching is going to be used for charge. So this is, this is the basic idea. I'm not going to teach people how to design switch capacitor filters. I'll leave that to the active electronics course. But you should know that these things exist. Um, they enable you to tune the filters dynamically. You can change the capacitance, the amount of time you spend charging and discharging. Um, and that enables you to alter the filter actively. So this replaces an active RC filter using what's called a reduced form factor. That means smaller and higher accuracy and tunable filter because you can control these switching rights. In fact, if you wanted to be really clever about it, you could write an Arduino program with a little analog um, uh, high-speed switch, 4079. 4069 analog CMOS switch will actually allow you to build these things discreetly if you want to. So you want an analog switch in here to charge and discharge your little capacitor and control it. And that's what a switch capacitor is. That's it. That's all there is to it, except, well, the design part, which is beyond the scope of this lecture. But that's what's going on inside. If you wanted, you could buffer it with a little op amp and then there's this little feedback capacitor. And what you're really doing is you're changing the effective capacitance of C sub S, the switch capacitor. And so that is um, a um, active um, switch capacitor filter right there. And uh, there are some interesting, for simple designs like this, there are some fairly simple formulas. When you're done building this whole thing, what you get is a frequency response curve, which corresponds to this little guy. And so now we can look at what's going on. This is right from the MT8870 um, data sheet. Um, X and Y, these are the dial tones. That has to be filtered out with the notch filter. But you can see what happens as you get to those frequencies. You get severe phase shift and distortions right in through here. But we don't really care about that. We just want to knock out those frequencies that are below uh, 440 hertz. And then over in here, we have a nice flat filter, really tuned so that it will respond and say yes to frequencies A, B, C, and D, which are your low frequencies between 697 and 941 hertz. Then you got a second filter. Um, and here's like one kilohertz in here. And uh, he's going to say yes to. E, F, G, and H. Meanwhile, the first filter says absolutely no to the E, F, G, and H, and kind of gives you a little bit of signal, but mostly not. And you got a nice flat area around E, F, G, and H. And so E, F, G, and H are your 1209 to 1633 hertz filters, uh, frequencies. So, so that's how that works. You can divide up with a low pass filter and a high pass filter, the two different um, frequencies, the low and the high group, uh, for the DTMF tones. So that's kind of an interesting thing that's coming out of this MT8870. A lot of technology in there that's analog. I mean, it's sort of mixed signal, really. Because um, switch, well, switching capacitors um, involves a digital signal, but the capacitors, of course, are analog. And then, um, then you take the high part and the low part, and you run them into two zero crossing detectors. See, we're not doing FFTs in here. We're counting the number of times. Well, first of all, we square up the waveform that comes out. So sine waves are coming out at different frequencies. We want to turn them into square waves. That's what a zero crossing detector does. You could say, oh, what's that? Does anybody have any idea what that could be? Zero cross detector? Any ideas? So it's, a, it's an op amp that runs from one supply rail to the other. When it's below a certain threshold, uh, it gives you a zero. When it's above a certain threshold, it gives you a one. And what it does is it takes these nice smooth square waves, uh, nice smooth um, sine waves, turns them into square waves. That's what it does. It's an op amp. It's a comparator. It's above a certain voltage. Um, it'll give you a, um, a one. If it's below a certain voltage, it'll give you a zero. Here it's inverted, so it doesn't really matter. We really need to count, right? Um, how many zero crossings you have per second. And now you know your frequency. 
So forget about all this FFT crap. We don't need that. We just need a counter. And we've taken digital design one, so we know how to build a counter. Besides which, I think even the Arduino has a counter built in because, well, one thing microcontrollers know how to do is they know how to count. Plus, you know, 1200 hertz is not that fast to count. So Arduino runs at 16 megahertz. You could easily count to 1200 hertz. I mean, that's not a problem. So that's the shtick, right? Now we've got our little comparator. We've got a square wave. And um, this is how you build a zero crossing detector with a dog breath op amp that you might find in the uh, shop. We've got a pile of these uh, hanging around the 741 op amp. And it'll go from one supply rail down to the other. And you can use these diodes to help assist, making sure that um, while well, you have a 7 tenth of a volt hysteresis around zero volts, so these things will just flatten out to the VCC or, flat, or, or flatten out to the VEE voltage. And you can run these voltages any way you like. Um, zero to five volts might be okay for your input, for your, for your, for your system. So that's, that's, how you, that's how you square up a sine wave. And then there's this mysterious digital detection algorithm. I don't know why they made it so mysterious. It's a counter, right? You just have to count the number of ones and zeros or count the number of ones in a given period of time. And you'll know what your frequency is. And that's it. That's your analysis. But they made this into like the secret sauce. I. I don't quite understand about the secret sauce. It's not really much of an algorithm, but that's how they label it and they don't tell you what's in it. But if it was me, I'd put a counter in there and just sort of count. It's a frequency counter. Now there's another way to do this. Um, you can do it with, um, with the bandpass filters, right? You could have eight bandpass filters and they all say yes when they see their specific frequency. And that's, that's legit. That's how they started these things. They are, you know, back in the beginning. Um, but because the bandpass filters were so big and expensive, uh, they were restricted to the central office, also known as the telephone exchange. Moreover, um, when you get to the higher frequencies, the plain old telephone system, also known as POTS, doesn't really do very well. So they give a pre-emphasis that is increased amplitude to those higher frequencies. They make them a little louder. That way they can get through. They call that a twist or pre-emphasis applied to compensate for the roll off. Um, that means you don't have good high frequency response in uh, POTS, plain old telephone system. Moreover, the, um, the bandwidth variance on these um, tones could be quite high. I mean, this is plus or minus 20 hertz. So you can get a um, sort of a 20 or a 40 hertz wide, um, I'll call it um, bandpass filter for each one of the frequencies. And you can essentially try and build it so you don't have to count the number of zero crossings. But counting zero crossings isn't that hard, especially for frequencies this low. So while this is the way they did it initially, it's not what they do in modern practical uh, systems because the digital stuff can easily outpace the bandpass stuff. So this is how you build a frequency counter. And that's kind of interesting, right? Because frequency counters are things that you can buy as test equipment. And all you're really doing is building a frequency counter for this one specific application. And it's all on the chip. But you could have done this with your, like, your Arduino. It would have been fine. And the only tricky bit would have been the switch capacitor filter which you could probably also build with an Arduino. So this is a um, uh, essentially a counting register. You have to tell it when to start counting and when to stop counting, and then you'll know your frequency. So if you count for a whole second and then you stop, you'll know what you counted up to and you'll know how many zero crossings you have and you'll know your, um, your frequency. And that's it. That's the whole shtick. And then there's this thing about the tip and the ring. And, and you know what they do in these th with these three and a half millimeter stereo jacks is they give you a thing they call the sleeve. So this is a TRS, tip, ring, sleeve, connector. And between um, the tip 
and the ring, you get the left channel between the sleeve and the ring, you get the right channel. There's another variant on this called the TRRS for tip ring ring sleeve. And that'll give you the ability to have a microphone as well. So a lot of times what will happen is you get, you know, something for your um, iPhone. It's got a tip ring ring sleeve because it expects to be able to talk to the, uh, have you talk into the iPhone as well as listen. And that's it. That's the whole sh shebang. That's, that's, the, um, that's the long and short of the uh, decoder chip. And uh, I just thought it would be interesting to try these things. I just got it over the weekend. I got so excited about it. I prepared this little lecture. And um, what you can do, if you go back, yeah, MT8870, you can actually Google the, um, the data sheets up on that stuff. Uh, let's see if I can grab my uh, MT8870. And there's the chip. And, uh, and here's the board. There's the board. Here it is, $1.33 on eBay. What a bargain. And then you can use these outputs and you can actually plug this straight into the Arduino input. Um, so if you if you wanted to, you could see the Arduino uh, plus the MT88 plugged in. So it actually has its leads, so it can plug straight in here, give get its power and ground, and give you a um, uh, a, a, a digital input to your Arduino for that application. Um, boy, that seems like it's worth a couple bucks. It'd save you all the wiring. Um, and you can get these things, as I said, um, much, much faster if you go through on Amazon. Here, Amazon will give you five pieces for $8.99. So that's a, that's a cool little um, uh, gizmo. And I, I just, I never had my hands on this before. So I just thought it was a fun thing to have. Um, you know, if you were thinking about ways in which to do automation remotely via telephone, I mean, you could do worse than dual tone multiple frequency control. And... Um, I just, I haven't even, I, I don't know what the applications could be. I used to have, be a chief engineer at a radio station and we used um, DTMF to control the transmitter. You could turn on and off uh, tower lights. You could turn up the uh, power. You could turn up the plate voltage. Uh, you could do all kinds of interesting things remotely using DTMF decoder. So that's kind of an interesting idea. Uh, you could measure power. You could, you know, dial something and maybe it, plays back through voice, something like the wind or uh, temperature at the remote site, uh, stuff like that. So, so you've got, you got an opportunity to uh, do all kinds of embedded control systems um, and, and um, with the DTMF. Let's you imagine, you could control a robot, right? And left, right with, with, with little uh, touch tone controls. Um, maybe, I don't know, what you'd like to control. But imagine the robot is so far away that you have to phone it up, right? It's not like less than a kilometer where a radio can reach it, but it's more like on the other side of the planet. Well, dial a phone and have it respond to the DTMF controller and you can put it into the kill, crush, destroy mode and then hang up. So there you have it, um, the DTMF decoder. What do you think? Pretty cool, right? Lots of applications. How exciting. Well, if you're not excited by this, I feel bad for you because it doesn't get better than this. I was very excited. So um, yeah, we've got this, um, this little DTMF um, project that we have to do. And uh, I, was, um, I was busy trying to um, kind of make it into a, a a separately compiled thing. So I came up with my own little uh, class for the DAC. And I figured, you know, if you change the DAC, maybe what you would do is you would keep the class DAC and then you would have some sort of a, um, a, a means of polymorphism, like an interface. And so um, here's the DAC implementation. And uh, I kind of like this because you know, it isolates the complexity, right? If, you're, if your only interface is this, you don't even know what pin number it's on, 
you could have made that an argument, I suppose. Um, but in fact, you don't even know what kind of DAC it is. Could be any kind of DAC. Could be that R2 DAC that the fellow used initially. So I like the idea of having sort of like a different um, uh, implementation. So later, you know, if somebody said, oh, I really want a 12 bit DAC, you could overload this operator and have it so that it takes an int instead of, um, instead of a byte, because ints in, um, well, ints on the, in the Arduino IDE are generally 16 bits, because you could get an unsigned 16 bit quantity too. So that, that in and of itself, I thought made the uh, code a little bit cleaner because it takes out the DAC and encapsulates the complexity and gives you a really simple interface. And then um, here's the DTMF code. Now it has its own sort of um, interface that looks relatively simple, generate output, wave generator. And then um, when we go and we look, we begin to see, you know, maybe this isn't the right thing to have done. Maybe we should have put in a, a seven in here. Sometimes we look at other people's code and we say, oh, what the heck is this guy doing? And as I was going through this, I said, well, I don't know why he makes you look this up in some sort of ASCII table because that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So this is why I decided that if you use the um, literal quote hash or Octothorpe, if you like, that's the proper name, you know, um, you don't have to actually look it up uh, because the compiler will do that for you. And in fact, if you think about it, uh, you could extend this system to use non-standard frequencies and non-standard codes. But for now, I think it's very nice that you can find convenient decoders that have been commoditized into relatively inexpensive hardware. And that, that sort of makes it nice for me, I think. So that's how I would rewrite this code just to make it a little bit more readable and certainly doesn't change the speed at all. Um, now let's see, we can see the, um, uh, the different uh, sort of uh, frequencies that are coming in to the columns and that's fine. And now here comes a wavetable. And I looked at this wavetable and I said, you know, What's the wave table size? 200. All right, what would it have taken for me to generate this wave table using, using, um, using sign? And, 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 and it really wouldn't have been that much, right? I mean, this is like four integer i equals zero while i is less than 200, i plus plus. And now in principle, uh, you could have said, um, something like wave table of I, I guess you use the square, square brackets, is equal to um, the sign of um, I, and you want it to range from uh, zero to two pi. So divide it through by 200 and multiply it by, um, two pi, and then uh, since that's 200 and the other is two, I would turn this into 100 and get rid of this two over in here. And then um, you want it to uh, range from, right now it goes from minus one to plus one. So you say one plus, so now it's going from zero to two. And so you want a number that goes from zero to one. 127, so take the whole thing, multiply by a half, and now it goes from zero to one, and then multiply the whole thing by 128. Is that the maximum number here? 128, yeah. So in principle, you could do it by, by 256, but just multiply by 128 and forget about the divide by two over in here. That'll simplify out. And so that would be an equivalent way to set it up in a, um, in a for loop.
that's that's my way of dealing with these sorts of things. I don't know why anyone would feel the obligation to type in these numbers. That doesn't sound like fun. Does that sound like fun to anybody? Who types in those numbers? That's crazy. You don't do that. Maybe you can cut and paste them from a program that you write. But uh, if it was up to me, um, I'd put this right here into the setup. And that would be a way in which to address the issue of um, having an embedded wavetable, especially one where you might want to increase the number of um, um, samples, right? Your wavetable size doesn't have to be limited to 200, or you can make it smaller. And I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It just, this doesn't strike. This is like a bad smell, I think. And so, um, you know, if you, choose, if you do change the size of the wavetable, then you have to take into account the rate at which you're clocking the wavetable out. And so that's a um, that's an issue. But in, in fact, I, I just say this is not the correct way to make a wavetable. It's a matter of taste, I suppose. And let's see what else we can do in here. So now the case statement the CAR1 is doing a dispatch off of 49, right? This literal is essentially the same thing as 49 over in here. So in other words, in principle, if you put CAR1 over here, it's no different. It's the same thing. So why, why create the extra thing and, and the answer might be well because we have this over here but then again you could back substitute that right in other words this will compile just fine what did i do unsupported board i got the wrong board selected my bad i probably had this set up for a micro yeah i did um do 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 do, do. This has got to go to Arduino AVR board Uno. Yeah, it works now. Yeah, the micro uses a uh, Atmega 32U, which is a slightly different chip. And I've got this in the, uh, how you say, in the macro. So if you were to upload this now, you should be able to get the annoying sound coming through. I don't know if you can hear that. But annoying sound. So there's the annoying sound. So in principle, um, your generate code, let's see, where was it? That's it, your DTMF code. Uh, you don't really need these um, characters to be embedded here. I mean, you could have written this as care A. And written this as care D. And then A and D, you know, you don't even need this, right? You could have just written, look, if you want A, put A in there. If you want B, put in B. You know what I mean? You don't need, you don't need the extra level of indirection by writing out care hash. The switch can take it. So it's a bit of refactoring, I think, but it kind of needs the refactoring because, well, in principle, let's see if this still works. Yeah, that still works. So, so in principle, you don't need any of that stuff. So this whole thing with the A and the B, I, I, I think I can comment that one out. Right? He doesn't need it. 
And so if you were to comment out something like this, the C, you can just copy it and everywhere there's a problem, paste it in. So here's C. And that's done. So that's that's my point about this code. It, it just seems like something wrong with this guy. I don't know. Take the hash thing, turn it into a hash. Take the zero thing, turn it into a zero. I mean, no kidding. Why would why would anybody want zero and hash to be written as as variables practically? And here's hash. I think I got all the instances of it, but I might be wrong. I missed one. Oh, yep, here it is. And I don't know, what does that buy you? Good, right? So, I mean, we could do the same thing with nine. And with star, I mean, this, this, this code needs refactoring, no doubt. But sometimes it's easier to refactor code than it is to um, rewrite it. Okay, this is nine. It's a star. should all work. Uh-oh. Oh, there it goes. So that's all working. And, you know, from my point of view, I think it makes sense to um, try and get rid of some of these embedded things I really don't see the need for them. Just comment it out, try and do a compilation, and everywhere you see it, just kind of paste it in. I don't think it's in too many places. That's it. And you could do that efficiently, I should think, if you were to um, just do a copy and paste. In fact, now that I'm sitting here, I could probably do the rest of it real fast and get rid of the um, reference to all of the characters at the top. I mean, doesn't that make the code seem easier to deal with? It would be nice yeah. to write it your own. Um your own you yeah know, i mean scratch. you could you could um there's probably i mean is there a better way to have done this one thing i can tell you is that this kind of a lookup is a terribly efficient way to go because key is now being used as a computed go to by any compiler worth its salt it'll create a table that'll essentially take the key and these numbers and compute offsets into addresses which will set these variables so that's kind of a nice way to go um, we could probably comment out all the rest of the numbers now. So I missed something, which I may well have done, actually. I think, I think in the if statement. No, I got it all. So I think the code just got a whole lot simpler. May have taken out at least 16 lines. So that's all working. So in principle, this all becomes garbage.
So that makes life a little bit easier. Makes the code a little bit, a little bit more efficient looking, a little easier to read anyway. Um, let's see what else we need to know. And any questions about this code? How about that that uh, that setup? Is that going to make our code slower? In the setup, yeah, but in iteration, no. No. Right. So, so um, in theory, um, if there was an initializer for this um, uh, DTMF you would be able to do that in the initializer. So that looks like the initializer right there. That's your constructor. So what I would do in a case like this is um, get the wavetable and set it right like that. Nice and neat. And then the rest of this, I guess you could just, um, well, I guess we would comment it out starting from here. And ending perhaps over here. Oops. And then somewhere in the um, in constructor, perhaps over here. What could possibly go wrong? Well, this is going to be a floating point number, isn't it? So we've got to we've got to find a way to round it. Um, hmm. I'm, I'm guessing round is a good way to do it. Only you probably have to spell it right. Um, I don't know if that works or not. What could possibly go wrong? Well, I've left the original code there in case things messed up. Oh my goodness. It's compiled. Let's see if it works. I kind of wrote this off the cuff. I didn't really think about it very much. So it might not work at all. Well, that, that's really cool. I like the way that sounds, but it doesn't sound like a sine wave. Um, I'm wondering if maybe I should give it a little more headroom. Let me just think about this. Um, I goes from zero to 200. 200 over one is equal to two. And two times pi is two pi, so that's good. So we're going from zero to two pi, generating sine waves that go from minus one to plus one. We add one, that makes it go from, oh, this makes it go from minus one, and it makes it go from, from zero to two. And then if we multiply by 126, that makes it go from um, 0 to 2 of these 6. How about we take 126 and cut it in half? Um, make, make 128 in half is 64. So let's call this 63. I think that's, I think that's all right. Because the wave table is only supposed to go from 0 to 127, I think. A little error in my, um, in my logic. This is what happens when you do these things live. There you go. Sounds good. So that's working. So the whole wavetable setup thing was just done when you initialize the um, class, which means you don't need any of this. Let me 
And that's how you make a wave table. In fact, if you think about it, it doesn't really care if it's a sine wave or a cosine wave, right? They're the same wave. So that should work too. And that makes life a whole lot easier because um, you can now change the shape of the waveform. If you wanted to, you could use tangent or something bizarre, I suppose. Right? Sine waves sound just like cosine waves, as well they should. I'll put that back. So um, that's my shtick on that one. We wanted a, um, a table, I'll, I'll write documentation, ranges from um, zero to 127. So in principle, maybe you could get a little more dynamic range out of this. I'm not quite sure if it'll sound distorted or not. I don't want it to go to 128, but I don't think it's gonna quite make it to uh, 200. The selected serial port does not exist. The selected, ser what happened? The selected serial port does not exist. No, 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 don't do this to me. What are you doing? Tools. There it is, it's right there. I can see it. I mean, it doesn't exist. Uh, your board is not connected. Your board is not connected. It can't be because I typed a, a four in here instead of a three. That doesn't make sense. Um, hmm. I think I'll uh, reset my little Arduino and then I'm just gonna see what's going on here. I broke it. How did I break it? The selected serial port is not connected. What? This was working two seconds ago. Okay. Life in the big city. So this is a very nice practical example of why you should never do demos live. I'm unplugging the serial port, the uh, Arduino, and I'm going to plug it back in. So I've unplugged and plugged. Let's see if that helps us. That's an Uno. That's the right serial port. If this doesn't work, I'm switching USB hubs. Oh, look, it's working. So I unplugged it and plugged it in, and now it's working. See, this is not a valid problem in computer science. Let's, just, let's hope this works now. Yeah, that works fine. All right. So before I got distracted by my Arduino falling off the... Uh, the edge of the uh, amount of voltage that my little USB hub can drive. I probably have too many things plugged in. What with the camera and the, and the other shtick. Let's see how this sounds. Oh, got buzzing. I got buzzing. I knew I would. All right, so there you go. That should be fine now. You can understand why the buzzing happens, right? Because if you go over the um, dynamic range capability of the um, uh, of the DAC, um, you wrap around. So this should sound okay now. Done compiling. Did it upload? I must have clicked on the wrong thing. Let's see if this works now. Yep, it's all working. Very fun, very fun. So that's the shtick. Any questions about the um, about the code? I can get rid of this thing now. It just got a whole bunch simpler, I think. Um, professor. Yes. If you were to use, um, you said cosine and sine sound the same since they're only shifted by a. Uh, by a phase of 90 degrees or a phase of phi. Yes, what sir. What would happen if you, um, if you use secant or cosecant? Uh, 
Is that a built-in function here? I don't, I don't think we have that. We'll Would it work if you just did one over sine or one over cosine? I mean, I could try it with tangent. I don't think it would sound very good. Um, let's try this. Right, because aren't there asymptotes? And the asymptotes are little pokey things and they're gonna sound real pokey, right? Because they go up real fast and they make little sharp edges and you're not gonna like the way that sounds, but let's hear it anyway. Ah, I can call the operator with my pocket calculator. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah, this is like a craft work thing. I actually like it. Um, so yeah, my, I don't actually, here's, here's the question. What do you, yeah, see the DTMF system can't deal with it because for, from the decode point of view, it's, it's, it's a big lose. You can't, you can't, I mean, he's stuck, put it that way. Just, just stuck. We'll do a, um, Let's shrink it down a little bit so you can see what's going on out here. All right. So um, you see, he's he's not a, he's not actually able to understand this thing. He's stuck. He's just he doesn't understand about the tangents. Okay. He, he, the whole thing was designed for sine waves. If you want to decode, you need you need to generate like sine waves or cosine waves. Um, now, if I were to go back and change this from uh, tangent to cosine, then you'd have something. Let's hear it. Yeah, now it's working. So that's, that's that. You don't see it very well because I've turned the contrast way down. I've got to turn this down here because that's annoying. But if you go to um, the so-called IPVO camera control display, you can change the um, way in which contrast is handled by going to um, default. And then you can actually see the device sitting here. There it is. That's the, I don't know if I can bring it a little closer. And you can change the autofocus on it. Let me change the autofocus so it looks. No, it is, it is on autofocus, I guess. So that's, that's the, um, you know, once you, once you change the, um, contrast, you get a glow from the LEDs that you really don't see when you look at it with the naked eye. But the camera sort of blooms when, when the CCD elements pick up on this, um, on the LEDs. That's why I turn the contrast down. What you really want is a red lens. You throw a red lens on there and it'll attenuate the output, the red output. So that's, um, yeah, you can do, I mean, any waveform you want, secant, cosecant, I don't know. But this guy, he wants sine waves, right? He's designed a switch capacitor system that's optimized for this application, put it that way. And, and that's all right. I mean, you know, that's kind of what it's for. If you said to me, well, but Professor Lyon, I really want to have more than 16 symbols. I want to have, um, I don't know, 128 symbols. Then I'd say, oh, okay. Then let's, you know, come up with a new way to do decoding because this may not be a DTMF system anymore. Maybe a system designed specifically for computers to communicate with computers. But here's the interesting thing: if you took your your program, just this program, and you encoded it using a four-bit symbolic system and then turned it into touch tones, you'd be able to store it onto audio tape, put it on a cassette, and then take it with you and then play the tape back 
and then this could decode it and you get back to your original program, right? You can store your programs now on magnetic tape, on audio tape. So that's kind of neat. Or you could send them through a phone line. And unless, um, <clears throat> unless the National Security Agency has an echelon program designed to decode touchstones and get back to your original code, and they may not, um, you should be reasonably secure, right? I mean, you've got a, a kind of an in-band mechanism for, um, yeah, we're not doing the R2 network anymore, for, for doing the uh, uh, transmission of digital data. So that's pretty cool, right? Any questions about this project? Any, any, anyone start the project or get stuck with the project? Because I, I, and the more I look at this project, the more I think, you know, there's a lot of, um, I'll call it, uh, I don't know, subtlety involved with the code and how with the way in which the, um, uh, the system has been um, put together. So it, it makes for a, um, a very interesting project, I think. Um, and I think you'll have a lot of fun with it. So that's what I have for you for today. Uh, any questions? No, thank you, Professor. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day and stay safe. You too. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.